Last time around, I spoke about uh, flight deck automation in the context of what digital technology has done to assist the pilot in his day-to-day -day activities of getting the job done. What I'll do this time is just quickly recap on that and then talk about what that same technology will do as far as what I generally refer to as any abnormalities that might occur in the system, be they uh, system-induced or crew-induced, and then what functions that, that, that are present to enable the pilot to get the aircraft out of trouble. So my uh, presentation is based on my knowledge in flying the, uh, the Boeing 717, which was a, a hybrid aircraft uh, consisting of the Triton proven airframe and mechanical and hydraulic systems of the uh, DC-9, coupled with new technology, avionics and electrics uh, that were essentially designed by Boeing for the 777. And of course, uh, the aircraft was uh, fitted with updated um, or um, high technology engines as well. As a starting point uh, to base my discussions on, I went back to the very early days of, of um, commercial jet aviation in Australia, and particularly looking at the uh, DC-9, which both ANSET and TAA had. And um, this photo here, taken a little later on than the early, early 60s, probably the late 70s, shown with a uh, Boeing a 727 100 series and also 200 series. Now the DC-9 offered uh, great leaps in technology at the time in the con context of its aerodynamics and also jet engine. But unfortunately the, uh, the backup systems or the, the systems which ran everything in the aircraft didn't also uh, enjoy a great leap forward in technology. So essentially we're talking about the systems which were in the uh, turboprops being carried for forward into the uh, early jet aircraft. Last time I gave you some appreciation of the complexities that were need, needed to be considered to determine the correct weight and balance of the aircraft, its runway performance in terms of the power required, and also the critical speeds for takeoff. Bearing in mind each and every runway is a little bit different and depends very much on the ambient conditions at the time. Also considerations of calculation of cruise altitude and also the aircraft performance envelope at that altitude. Once the aircraft was airborne, as far as navigation was concerned, air traffic control radar was of very little use because uh, the, the radar picture was by no means continuous across the country or even up and down the east coast for that matter. And the uh, primary radar signal of the day could be very easily attenuated by weather and so on. So the uh, pilots were required to um, use their tried and proven techniques of old to determine where the aircraft was with regard to on track and also distance down track. Distance down track was particularly critical uh, heading westbound, where you'd spend a reasonable amount of time without too many navvies to be able to determine exactly where you were. And if you're getting behind time, well, then you're getting getting below your fuel line, and are you going to have sufficient gas to get through to Perth? And how was all how all, was all this integrated uh, by the pilots? Well, this is what they had to work with. Their primary instrument for instrument flying conditions is the attitude indicator. And a third one hidden away somewhere. Quite small instruments but required a lot of a lot of precise monitoring thereof to uh, keep yourself on the straight and narrow. So each and every sensor uh, had its own individual display in the cockpit and it was up to the uh, pilots themselves to integrate that information. How they do that? They saw it and then they and then they thought about it in the grey matter uh, between their ears. And hopefully they kept the show on the road 
and got to their destination and well they, they did <laughs> and I might add that the DC 930 was one of the very first of the two place uh, pilot uh, flight decks. If we move on to the digital age just about anything can be digitized by a software engineer. A software engineer is going to do his very best and he's going to show He's going to present the information as he thinks best, but of course he's not a pilot, so there's an awful lot of input required to the software engineers by both uh, human factors people and test pilots to ensure that the information that is displayed to the pilot is meaningful, it's timely, it's doesn't, it's uh, not liable to be confused and it's in a manner that he can easily understand. You may rec recall, if you were here last time, that I made the analogy of the flight deck here with your home computer system. You have uh, probably only one monitor uh, for your home system. Here there are six. Each pilot has a primary flight display and an AV display and there's also an engine and alert display which shows your primary engine parameters the section underneath being um, set aside for any systems alerts which need to come up and there's a secondary systems display there which, show, which can show a wide range of information Apart from your monitor, you've got a keyboard. The primary part of your keyboard is your QWERTY uh, section, your alpha and numeric section, where you can input information into the system. And that, can, and that is done in this machine through both of these keyboards here, duplicated. Above your QWERTY part of your keyboard, you have a row of function keys and they are there to, to allow you to vary the format of what you have displayed on your computer if you so wish. The equivalent area in the cockpit here is directly above each pilot's now display for him to twiddle to his house desire to set up his display as he wishes. Pilot and first officer and you might be able to note here that the pilot has his is uh, compass rows shown in arc format, about plus or minus six degrees of the centre line, whereas the uh, first officer has a conventional 360 degree compass. And the first officer is also showing some, some digital uh, terrain database as well. Finally, in your home computer, you have your, uh, your cursor and your mouse to manipulate information on your screens and that is this central section here which either pilot can easily access. So there's quite a bit of information there but surely not everything. Uh, no there isn't. As far as the systems display is concerned you obviously need to be able to pull up hydraulic systems, electric systems, pneumatic systems and so on and that is done through a series of push switches down here and the, uh, the irrelevant uh, press will give you whatever systems you need up there and also if there is a uh, an issue with a system such as you might have a hydraulic low pressure uh, you'll be there'll be a little switch light a little light in the uh, relevant switch which comes up and says press hydraulics and it'll bring up hydraulics for you. Looking just a little closer at the two primary flight instruments, the uh, PFD and the NAV display, I'll just guide you through, talk you through a couple of shows here. Okay, we have the aircraft's uh, pitch indicator and wind, wing indicator showing just a little bit below five degrees nose up. We have a sky pointer and a skip ball type presentation here. This triangle will become a trapezoid if the aircraft is not balanced. 
The magenta cross is the flight director. Being, a, being aligned with the aircraft symbol uh, signifies that the autopilot is running the system. And directly above, we have AP2 indicating that it's autopilot number two, which is in control of the system. Moving across, we have a pseudo analog presentation of the VSI, thousands of feet, about 1800 foot a minute, with a digitized presentation up there, climbing at 1800 feet per minute. Climbing through 14,400 feet and clear to its inputted cruise altitude of 31,000 feet. Across the other side, we have a, a, a airspeed indicator. 311 knots the aircraft's climbing at, and the instantaneous Mach number at the time is 0.607. And as with all airspeed indicators, we have a, a maximum not, ex not exceed speed shown by the red section here, 342 knots. Interestingly also, a little bit of extra information, GE, maximum speed for gear extension, SE, maximum speed for slat extension. All very handy. Across the top, by these figures being in magenta, they're indicating that they are the parameters that the uh, flight plan has been loaded to. If the aircraft was, if the pilot decided he needed to adjust his speed, then that's, that speed will normally be in, appear in white. <coughs> Down the bottom, we have the, uh, the uh, most important part of your compass, and that's in, indicating a heading of 009. And there's a little track pointer there, which is not showing there for some reason or other. Okay, moving across to the nav display, an arc presentation. The aircraft's climbing away from Perth, and we have the two nav aids, which auto-tune, pointing back towards to, towards Perth. And the aircraft recently has been cleared from its, it's taken off into the south in Perth. <coughs> Float is standing this departure, which goes out this way. Uh, it's been cleared to cancel its standard <coughs> departure and track, track direct to its first waypoint down line, which is a, uh, a turning point here, and off he goes to to this point and then to Parabadu or Port Hedland. Uh, tracking, tracking index up the top here, a track of zero on one, and it's selectable as to whether you have heading or track uh, as your climbing, as your reference. The time in UTC 22.49, so 6.49 a.m. So no, not much traffic around, hence he's being cleared to track direct to uh, first point on his flight plan. And 007 time airborne. And because, because a navigation system can compute all the, uh, it's got all the variables it needs to be able to compute wind, uh, we have a graphical presentation here of the wind. 242 at 20 dots, TAS and ground speed. All the information you'll ever need to navigate an aircraft, bearing in mind that it is navigating it for you. Now, if, if we can move on into the um, get out of get out of trouble areas. First function, central oral warning system. If you drive a relatively, relatively modern motor vehicle, the first turn of the key, or when you first press your start button, your speedo and taco binnacles light up like a Christmas tree with red lights and amber lights and green or blue lights. By the time the start sequence is finished, you have probably only got the, uh, the red, a red light on for your park brake, and when you're driving normally, no lights are on at all. If you're driving along, you see a green light or a blue light, you might be able to make out the symbology um, doesn't bother you too much. If you see an amber one, mm, a bit sus. If you had someone with you in the car, you might ask them to 
go into the glove box and have a look at the handbook and see if that one means, see, see what that symbology means. Um, if it's a red one, you're not sure, um, stop, cause red for danger. That's, uh, so that technology has devolved down from the aviation industry and has been around for a very long time. The Mirage fighter I flew was designed back in the early 60s and it had a, a red uh, matrix warning panel, uh, three across and about eight deep, containing all the, all the uh, pain you could ever wish to know about. And I guess uh, civil aircraft would have had similar technology by the uh, mid 70s. In the 717, uh, you have a full suite of all the, all the systems um, limitations or abnormalities on that central panel I mentioned before and any associated with flight path appear in that top section of the uh, pilot, uh, primary flight display and the nav display. But in addition to the red warnings, uh, red warning lights, there is also oral, oral supplementation. Now why? Why is that necessary? And it's necessary because man is the weakest link in the chain. Man is a two-dimensional being. He's designed to have his feet flat on the floor and not operate in the third dimension. So if you're flying and it's a lovely day, you know, we, you can see where you're going, everything's fine. But if there's a bit of weather around and you're relying on your instrumentation and things start to go awry, well then you need all the, all the assistance you can get. And how many times have, have the wrong engine, has the wrong engine been shut down? The right engine is good, the left engine is bad, the right engine gets shut, gets shut down. So an awful lot of consideration has gone into what oral information is presented to the pilot. And I'll mention two parameters associated with fire. Fire is probably your, your, worst, your worst enemy airborne. And I'll mention two situations. Uh, first involving an auxiliary power unit fire and then an engine fire. In the case of uh, auxiliary power unit fire, what you will get will be a, an alert that something is wrong, then the location and then the condition. So for APU fire, there'll be a warning horn, blah, and then APU fire, APU fire, APU fire. In comparison, for an engine fire, there's a bell, a good old fashioned um, American fire engine bell, uh, the condition, and then where it is. So, so for an engine fire, you'll get clang, 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 fire, left engine. Now that should be very, very clear to the pilots as to what the problem is. Okay, moving on to flight envelope protection. Now all of us who are pilots have probably got airborne with the, uh, the trims, the rudder trim and the elevator trim, perhaps not, by, not quite being where they should be. And uh, it then becomes obviously a, very obviously aware to us when the aircraft does get airborne. It doesn't feel right not very quickly, you adjust the trim. The 717 will do that uh, for you and more so. Lining up on takeoff, you advance the throttles for takeoff. If the configuration is not tickety boo, well then you'll get the warning horn, the blare, and then it addresses the issue at hand. Be it brakes, slats, flaps, the stabiliser or rudder trim, or the rudder trim. Once you are airborne, there's a, a variety of warnings as well. If the autopilot and the auto throttles are driving the aircraft, it will stay within its system parameters. But if the pilots are hand flying, well, and, they, and if they get outside of parameters, well then they'll be told about it. Should the, should the pilots hand fly the aircraft? Yes, they should. Because if they can't and the systems aren't working as they should do, and they do need to fly the aircraft, if they're not reasonably 
au fait and hand flying the aircraft, they're not going to be able to do so to the degree that they might need to. So in the hand flying situation, if you exceed too much bank, it'll tell you bank. If you're doing an instrument approach and you're getting low on your um, approach glide path, you'll be told glide path. If you go too fast, you'll get a you'll get a, uh, a clacker, clack 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 clack, over speed. When you disengage the if your if your autopilot is, in, is is engaged and you disengage it, you'll get a warbler, whoa 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 whoa, autopilot. So so the the oral indications there really help you out with regard to what's going on. Also, if you uh, if the pilots do things out of sequence, if they configure the aircraft out of sequence, they'll be alerted to it. So, for example, normally when you configure, you're configuring the aircraft for landing, you use the slats to help you slow down, a little bit of flap, um, you then drop the gear, uh, and then you go for full flap for the landing. If for whatever reason you get out of sync and you select full flap and the gear's still up, You'll be told about it with a warning horn, blah, landing gear. Similarly, if you've used speed brake to help yourself slow down, you're a little bit rushed, things get a little bit out of hand, and you forget about the speed brake being out as you configure the aircraft for landing. It's not unsafe because the auto throttle will just give you more, more power, but the system will tell you speed brake, dummy. Ground proximity warning systems. Almost since the very first day of, of heavy than air flight, pilots have been inadvertently flying perfectly serviceable aircraft into immovable objects, usually Mother Earth. There was, there was noted to be a significant increase in these occurrences after the start of the jet age. Why might that be? Well, I, I might suggest this, that it's because the, the aircraft were just getting away from the pilots. A jet aircraft is very slippery. If you stick the nose down the hill, even with a lower power setting, with a low power setting, because the aircraft's got low frontal area, it will accelerate quite rapidly. Once again, no problem if you can see where you're going. But if conditions aren't all that, all that good, and you're in the cloud, a uh, few things happening, the aircraft's getting along by six or seven, eight miles a minute, and your brain's only doing two or three miles a minute, well then you end up being quite behind the system. Problem was, aircraft are running into the ground. So the boffins said, well, we need, to, we need to relate the aircraft to the ground. We need to give the pilots some uh, independent warning of where the ground is. So they came up with the idea of fitting a, a radio altimeter or radar altimeter to the aircraft, looking straight down below the aircraft and cutting, cutting it off um, cutting the signal off to about 2,500 feet or so, and if they infringe the ground to that extent, the terrain to that extent, they would get a, a warning, a sink rate warning or a pull-up warning. Now that's all very good if you're descending over flat ground or relatively, relatively undulating terrain. But what if, you, if you're descending down towards a range of hills or um, a range of big mountains? In that case, you need something that's, that'll give you some indication of what's ahead of you. And with digital technology, what they've, able, what they've been able to do is to digitise the database so that the aircraft knows where it is at any time and will give you appropriate warnings. Sink rate, sink rate if you're descending too rapidly. Terrain, terrain, if there's terrain ahead. And the really important one, pull up, what, what, pull up. And the 717 uh, handling notes in response to that say, select full power, which is, which is emergency power going through a gate, which will give you maximum power without cooking the engines and rotate to 20 degrees nose up without reference to the uh, autopilot or the flight director on the few occasions where you need to get out there or you're going to die. Full power, 20 degrees nose up. 
and with the uh, with the addition of the digital database, the system, the GPWS system is now referred to as an enhanced ground positioning warning system. Wind shear. We've all experienced wind shear. In its mildest form, it's called turbulence. So that can be mechanical turbulence, where the air is disturbed by blowing over trees or terrain, or it can be heat turbulence with hot air rising. In an analogy I like to refer to there is a is a kettle boiling, water boiling in a, in a kettle. And turbulence is simply uh, a change in wind velocity, which is either direction and or speed. And apart from that lateral direction, it might be vertical direction as well. Now in the States, there is a, there's a real problem with, with wind shear. And, the is and I might suggest that it's, it's such a great problem in the States because they have massive mountain ranges which apart from causing lots of mechanical turbulence pushes the air up and you get an unstable environment you get you get human, human nimbus clouds thunderstorms and all that sort of stuff and in addition to that they have a a land mass which extends from polar reg regions down to the tropics if those land masses are benign and one Sorry, if, those, if, those, if the air masses in those land masses are benign and one gradually transitions from, from one to the next, not a problem. But if you have a, an outbreak of polar air heading south or tropical air heading north, then all sorts of things unimaginable can happen. Hence, uh, wind shear is such a very great issue and is, um, and is catered for very much in aircraft these days. Here, here in Australia, we occasionally get the triggers, get the wind, the wind shear triggers, but they are usually um, only transitory and of just very, very small magnitude into the wind shear envelope. So we have two forms of wind shear, reactive wind shear, and that's where the aircraft, there's a sense change to the aircraft flight path, which is, which is not a result of inputs by the pilots. And because there is a, a, very, a very accurate uh, inertial come GPS reference system, it's very, very easy to, to sense those changes and, and configure the system accordingly. The presentations that we given for that the oral presentations are if there's a increasing performance wind shear like you're going into a higher speed or a rate of climb you'll be told head wind shear and the worst case scenario is where performance is dropping off or well, then you'll be told tail wind shear and this these systems are only mechanized once again at fairly low level usually about 2500 feet or so um, above, or from 2,500 feet above the ground down to ground level. What the pilot does to respond to that is to advance, advance his uh, thrust levers and then the flight director will kick in with the appropriate um, parameters for the, for the pilot to fly to to stay within a reasonable speed if he's going into an increasing wind, wind shear performance situation or going to the most critical speed that the, the uh, flight management system and the flight director will give him to stay, to stay the, to inhibit the air or prevent the aircraft from impacting the ground. Now apart from reactive wind shear, you can also have these, these days have predictive wind shear uh, due to there being in addition to the aircraft's navigation radar, which is in the centimetre band. There's a, another radar in the uh, millimetre uh, wavelength band, which detects particles in the atmosphere. So it can look a few miles ahead of the aircraft and see little bits of dust or whatever moving up and down or left and right. And once again, that can be, that can be, dis that can be transmitted to the pilot uh, various ways. If there is an issue uh, with uh, some wind shear being 
ahead of the aircraft, but perhaps not quite on centre line, and it's usually quite a quite quite a limited um, envelope, say a few degrees left or right of centre line, out to about two or three miles ahead of the aircraft. If there's something a little bit off centre line, you'll be told monitor radar display, and if there's actual wind shear there, if he's on the ground, he'll be told wind shear ahead. And if you're on finals, uh, there is the uh, information tells you go around, wind shear ahead. So power up and follow the flight director pass. TCAS, traffic collision uh, avoidance system, or more correctly, traffic alert and coll collision avoidance system. I mentioned a couple of times a primary ATC radar. Um, which relies on its, its blip to go out to the aircraft, be bounced off the aircraft and come back to its sensor. That didn't work too well, so eventually secondary radar came along whereby the air traffic control blip goes out. It, it uh, activates a transmitter in the aircraft which sends back a coded message to the air traffic controller which tells the air traffic controller everything that he would want to know about that particular aircraft. Now, there's always been a problem with aircraft flying into each other, uh, either due to air traffic, either in the presence of air traffic control or not. So the Moffins put their heads together, say, must have been 15 or so years ago, and decided that what they could do would was separate aircraft or present a situation whereby pilots could self-separate themselves if the individual transponders in each aircraft spoke to each other. And that's, that's, a, that's a schematic. And with the transponders talking to each other, that allows, if the aircraft get within certain parameters, for information to, to be displayed uh, in, the cop in the cockpit on the uh, vertical speed indicators to the, for the aircraft to self-separate if the pilots follow those indications. The mechanisation is dependent on how close the aircraft are in altitude and also how close they are going to come in terms of uh, crossing distance. Obviously, if something is well out of well out of your way of track, you might be alerted to it, and um, given the advice, traffic, traffic. If there's something very close in, and it's climbing up through your altitude, as is as as is the case with the red indication, red indication there. Each aircraft is going to be given complementary uh, instructions as to what to do. And that might, that, well, one aircraft might get a climb, climb, and the, and the, the other one would get a descend, descend. And there are various other combinations as well. This is uh, purely a, a hand flying event and requires the uh, pilot to disengage the autopilot and then pitch the aircraft up accordingly to the, to the space in the VSI which has been directed by the TCAS system. Now, at the cruising speeds we're talking about, one degree of pitch attitude change equates to about seven or 800 foot a minute rate of climb. So you can see you have to be very, very sensitive indeed on the controls so as not to over control in this sort of situation. And uh, consequently, it is something which is practiced each and every time you go to the simulator. When the aircraft, are, and I might add that, also add that this is the one manoeuvre that you can carry out in controlled airspace, which doesn't require an air, an air traffic control clearance. In fact, it is mandated upon instantaneous response by the pilots to, the, to these signals uh, within five seconds. Once you are clear of the, uh, once the aircraft are clear of each other, well then you'll be, you'll be advised clear of conflict. Therefore, you can return to your, to your original assigned level. Now, computers are very capable, but they're not intelligent. 
and you've probably heard of garbage in, garbage out. So therefore, there needs to be a very, very strict regime for data entry. And on the ground, usually, it's the first officer who will select a particular uh, bit of data, and then the captain confirms that before the first officer enters it. Airborne is the pilot who is not flying, who selects the information, the pilot flying confirms, and then it's entered. However, this is not infallible because once again, we've got man in the loop. Some five years ago, there was a case on the, on the East Coast where uh, an international carrier going a long, long distance managed to end up um, importing a gross weight of the aircraft which was way, way, way below uh, that of what it should have been or that, that, that of what it was. As a consequence, the flight management system, the engine, did all of its parameters and decided it needed whatever power level for takeoff. This, this power, of course, being way down on what was needed. So the aircraft set off down the, uh, down the runway and it was only at some late stage that the, the pilots realised what was going on. Uh, they gunned the engines and just managed to get airborne at the far end of the, far end of the runway and in the process they took out some of the uh, architecture associated with the, with the uh, approach for the opposite runway which gave the aircraft a bit of a, a gravel rash and eventually they, they came back and landed. Now how can this possibly happen? I'd like to suggest there are possibly two, two error sources, fatigue and rushing. Now there are very, very strict parameters with regard to flight and crew duty limitations and these even allow for circadian rhythm due change of time zones, etc. Now just because you've had the, the duty, the, the official uh, quantified rest period, doesn't necessarily mean you are rested. Uh, you, might, you might have uh, personal troubles at home, there might be a million one things that are on, the mind, on your mind, you could be in a noisy room, uh, so it stands to reason you're not necessarily going to be fully up to speed each and every time you go to work. And the other is rushing, uh, rushing to beat the clock. Once again, a million and one re reasons. The guys in their uh, hotel, um, the uh, organised transport might have been late arriving. Might get caught in a traffic jam on the way there, the way to the airport. The aircraft might be late in and there's a rush turnaround. Uh, maybe they're just about to push back and air traffic control gives them a runway change and there's a million one parameters they need to change to, to uh, get, the sh get the aircraft off on the appropriate runway. All these can lead to to um, errors, major errors in the system. So as, as a final uh, check, it's always a good idea to have a degree of reasonableness. Okay, we've we've, in, we've inputted all the parameters in, all the parameters into the system. Are the outputs are the output parameters reasonable? So we've got a certain gross weight uh, from our general experience is the is the indicated engine pressure ratio for takeoff reasonable? Uh, are the the all important V speeds on takeoff reasonable? Uh, and as an example, I'd, I'd like to uh, give you an indication that I recall from flying the 717. If we're going from here to uh, Kalgoorlie, and we had a full load of passengers and very little of off, if, if not no freight, well then a, a gross weight on takeoff, a gross weight would be around about 46,000 kilos. The other end of the spectrum within the state, if we're going to Broome, uh, the gross weight's going to be, should come in around about 51, 52,000 kilos. If it was significantly different to that, like out by about 1,000 kilos or more, I'd be looking to say, is that right? I'd, I'd go back and double check everything to make sure that 
when we were all tickety-boo. Here we are on finals, coming to the end of things. As you can see, uh, there, there are, there's an awful lot that is there to assist the pilot in getting, getting things done uh, within the digital, digital age, but there is still an awful lot that can go wrong. So, sure, life is a lot more cruisy than it used to be, but it's certainly no place for complacency and you become complacent at your peril. So hopefully everyone that you fly for will, will be super diligent and I would suggest that perhaps if you avoid domestic carriers in the third world, um, <laughs> you might not get that due level of diligence. Thank you very much.